Hello, everyone. My name is Valerie Purdy Greenaway. I am a professor of psychology at Columbia Business School. And this is, uh, I think, without a doubt, the most exciting day that I have. I am here with my dear friend uh, and collaborator, uh, Dr. Buju Desgupta, who is going to introduce herself briefly. And then um, we are going to have a great time uh, engaging in, a, in an interview and a conversation about her life and her story as a scientist. So, hey, Valerie. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. Um, so most of you know me as, as Buju Dasgupta, but uh, when I publish, I use my real name. And in case you've never known how it was pronounced, it's Nilanjana. So Nilanjana Dasgupta. Um, I'm a professor of psychology, uh, like Valerie, at University of Massachusetts in Amherst. I also hold two other hats, I wear two other hats. I'm the director of faculty equity and inclusion in the College of National Sciences at UMass, uh, which is sort of an administrative role related to faculty climate, recruitment, retention, faculty advancement. I am also um, the inaugural director of a new institute called the Institute of Diversity Sciences. And there's lots to be said about that. I'm sure we'll talk about that later. And it sort of is cuts across all of the STEM colleges at UMass. Yeah, so you're not really busy right now at all. <laughs> so, you know, our goal today is to share with the audience um, your your journey. You know, I've known you as a long time. I'm an incredible fan as well as as well as friend. Um, and I know you have uh, friends, you have colleagues, you, uh, you know, probably all over the, the world. And the idea today is to um, share, you know, I, I know that that you are a, a fan of Goffman, but sort of front stage and backstage. And so what, what that means is the, the front stage, what is the, the, you know, what is your, your story of how you became a, a scientist? What are the principles that you believe in? Um, you know, what, what, what do you want your legacy to be? And, and then there's sort of the, the backstage Stage. Um, you know, what are some of the um, lower moments that you've had as a as a faculty member? Did you ever think that um, you were going to do something else? Um, you know, what are kind of the, the the stories that that got you to to where you are um, today? So that's the that's the the goal of of today, and um, I'm I'm just really looking forward to it. So why don't we just uh, hop in and get going? Sure, let's do it. So, so I guess what, what I'd love to do is just um, sort of start off with where you are right now. When you describe, you know, sort of formally, if you were to give a symposium, what's your broad area of research? Um, what do you do? Um, you know, you know how, how is your lab organized? Um, and just, just so we can sort of situate wh where you are um, right now as a scholar. Sure. Um, so my research is on um, implicit bias, but more generally on how societal stereotypes that may be in the background influences the way others see us and we see others. And I'm particularly interested in the ways in which those subtle stereotypes uh, and biases change as a function of the, the social context we are in. And so a lot of my research these days focus on the impact of those implicit stereotypes on the self. So to what extent do cultural assumptions, expectations um, influence what we choose to do, what we don't, even though we may not be aware of it, um, and what kinds of alternative environments can help us deflect those stereotypes and not be affected by it. And the other thing I'll say is that I see my research being um, coming from the Lewinian tradition in the sense that I'm not my work is not about everything just in the mind, but it's the person in context um, and the kind of context that I think influences individuals the most, uh, which is the focus of my research is the local context. So what is the social network uh, that people are embedded in? 
Uh, who do they see every day at work, home, peers, friends, and also what are the media they consume? Um, and all of that, I think, is the local milieu that influences social perception, how we see ourselves, what we are affected by or not. That's, that's awesome. And um, what does your lab look like these days? Oh my gosh, remote, of course. <laughs> 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 what else? Yes. Um, uh, so at any given time, I, I'm not sure if this is the version of the question you're asking, Valerie. Um, I have about you know three undergraduates. Uh, until very recently, I had two postdoctoral fellows. Um, probably about anywhere between three and seven undergraduate research assistants. Wow. Um, and so, yeah, so it's a, it's not a huge lab and that's by design. Um, I like to uh, make sure that it's tight enough that we, we are sort of closely knitted. I'll also say that in addition to the three grad students who right now two who are my primary collaborators and advisees, I also have in my lab another um, three other graduate students who also come to my lab regularly. And we have, in, in some cases, we have projects together. In other cases, we have shared interests. So it's sort of a pretty um, open lab. There's core students who are my primary collaborators and then another three who are my secondary occasional collaborators. That, that's wonderful. That's exactly what I was wondering, just in terms of who who is in your sort of intellectual uh, family. So that is that is wonderful. Well, here's what I'd love to do is sort of, you know, go back um, as far back as, as you'd like to, to help us to understand um, your story or your conscious uh, understanding of how you got to be where you are today. So, you know, we, we've shared stories of, of, of your past um, that, that doesn't necessarily start in, in the United States, but I'd love to hear, tell us about your, your family, tell us about your, your background and sort of, you know, tell us a little bit about um, college, you know, before grad school and, and, and sort of, you know, get, get, get us going uh, along the way of how you got to be uh, who you are today. Yeah, I think, you know, in preparation for this conversation and another similar one uh, that I had uh, a couple of years ago, I've been thinking a lot about how I got into science. Um, and I think the best I can connect the dots backwards um, is that there are these two strands that are very uh, deep in my family. One is the strand of science and the love of science. And the other is the strand of uh, social justice. So I want to start by, by I'll tell you the, the story, but then I want to show you some pictures of the, of the people. Oh, I would love that. Um, so I figured it would, we would get, give it some color and, and some, some real faces. So my parents, both my parents um, were in the sciences. My, my mother was a physiology professor. Uh, and I should say that I grew up in India. I was born in India. I grew up in India and I came to the US as an undergraduate student when I was 18. Mm -hmm. So growing up, my, my, my mother was a physiology professor. My dad was uh, an engineer, is an engineer, now retired. And so the love of science and learning and encyclopedias and books and all of that was sort of in the house all the time. Um, and there were very few toys. It was mostly books. Books is what we got as, as birthday presents. Yes. And look what's um, in your background. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And there are books in my background and hard copies, not electronic, hard copies. Uh, um, so, so sort of books were, were everywhere. And in some ways, there were too many books, I guess. Uh, my grandparents were very uh, active in the Indian liberation um, against British colonial rule. So they were growing up and young adults in the 1930s. India got its freedom from... from uh, British rule right after World War II in 1947. Uh, but before that, as you might know, or some of you might know who are history buffs, um, there was a big push to, to expel uh, a Brit British, a British uh, or Britons from, from India. Uh, and I think the rest of the world knows um, mostly one of, of the Indian 
um, sort of uh, uh, nonviolent leaders, Mahatma Gandhi. And my grandparents were very actively working with Gandhi um, to free uh, India from the British rule. And so stories about um, about sort of the freedom movement was very common in my grandparents' house. And one generation before that, my great-grandmother, my maternal uh, great-grandmother was a feminist writer who became widowed very early um, and became and start to write these stories initially anonymously about the sexism in Indian society in the early 1900s. So the, there was a big influence of science. There was this huge focus on, on social justice and, and uh, freedom from colonialism. And I should also say that post-independence, my grandparents, uh, when, when India was divided into India and Pakistan, and there was this mass migration of people, Hindus moving east, and, and Muslims moving west, there was incredible rioting and bloodshed and wow. a lot of refugees. Um, and so my grandparents were uh, hugely in charge of the refugee resettlement wow. on the eastern side of the border between what is now uh, India and Bangladesh. At that time, it was East Pakistan and India. Um, so I think the stories about refugees, the stories about, about independence, and the stories about um, this, this young widowed woman writing uh, about sexism in India in the early 1900s was sort of part of the milieu. So um, this is a long-winded way of saying that science and social justice were sort of these common threads. Um, I had no psychology background um, when I came to the US. I, was, I came to be a biology major, actually. Um, and I discovered psychology as a, as a student at Smith College uh, because it was, it was sort of encouraged to be through, because of a liberal arts curriculum, to take as many courses in as many fields as you, as you could. So I happened to take a psychology course, and mm -hmm. I thought, what is, what is this? You're sort of using <laughs> science to study the mind yes. and what we think we are, we are actually not. And you can collect data on how the human mind functions and you can study intergroup relations and, and inequality using this method. And I was completely blown away. Wow. And, and, and by the look on your face, you still yeah. are. <laughs> <laughs> I still am. It's the it's the perfect marriage yes. of using science in the interest of social justice. Um, I feel the same um, way. Where it's not based on our opinion, yes. it's based on evidence. Yes. Um, so I ended up switching to psychology and neuroscience um, mm -hmm. as my as my majors, and that was the beginning. Interesting, interesting. Oh, then, let me show you some pictures before I forget. I would forget. love to see pictures. I'd love to see pictures. So uh, here are my parents. Um, um, my mother, who was a physiologist, uh, who is no longer alive. My dad, who is an engineer, uh, retired and very much alive. My grandparents, um, this is must have been taken by the looks of them in the 1940s, wow. um, who, were, who were really involved um, with Gandhi. And in fact, partly my grandmother, when my aunt was only four months old, was part of a, of a, a civil disobedience um, to protect sort of Muslims and Hindus from rioting, um, wow. which was not not a very safe thing to do. Uh, and here is my great grandmother, who wow. was a feminist writer, um, who uh, wrote about sexism um, anonymously, and then started writing in her own name. Um, wow. And I remember her house being the the place where there was a just a lot of literary types, a, a lot of women writers who would come. So that's that's the beginning. It's giving me goosebumps because you all actually look you look like your parents and you look like your grandma. It's just it's just it is just it is that is that is amazing. That is amazing. After this, we're on to your biography. <laughs> <laughs> so 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 take us forward. So you so you 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 had this experience as an undergrad. I want to go back and ask questions about that. And and then and then uh, you know. 
we, we don't just magically get get into a sort of sail through uh, grad school. I'm sure many many people that are that are listening want to know about your time in grad school and your your early years as a faculty member. So can you share a little bit of yeah. of that and and. I guess what I'm really thinking about is is sort of how did you start to hone your your ideas and also what are some of the struggles that you went through um, during those early years? I think the question of struggle is a really, really good one and one we probably don't talk about enough. So I'll definitely uh, speak to that. So I think what I by the time I ended undergraduate, I knew that that what I wanted to do, was the, the, the science of social justice, the science of intergroup relations, science of inequality. Uh, so I knew that I wanted to get a PhD. And there was a point when I was trying to figure out, should I go the neuroscience route or social psychology? But the social justice part really pulled me into social psychology. And I think if at that time, this is 1992, if social cognitive neuroscience had existed then, I would have combined the two, my major and minor, but it didn't exist then. So I had to make a choice. Um, so I, I uh, uh, chose to go to, to Yale and um, I chose Yale because uh, of Mazarin Banaji, who, was, who I knew was doing research um, in, in uh, stereotyping and prejudice uh, only because my undergraduate advisor happened to meet Mazreen at a conference. I didn't know who she was except for that connection. Um, and remember, this is the day, these are days before uh, the internet. So it and wasn't email, as if we were yes. looking online to yeah. see who do we want to work with. That just didn't exist then. Um, so luckily, um, fortunately, I, I, I was accepted into Yale. That was my, my top choice. Um, and I got to graduate school. What I realized, and this is the this is part of the struggle that the that social psychology at that time was very focused on social cognition, which was all about the mind. And typically it was about the mind in a decontextualized way. So the social part of it was really what you imagined or things you you read the Donna Donald paradigm from the 1970s was very popular. So it was very, very bare bones. And that is not the social psychology I had envisioned. So for a while, um, and some I, I don't know, Valerie, if I ever, ever uh, told you this, I I thought of dropping out of graduate school. I thought uh -huh. maybe I'm better better suited for policy or for grassroots organizing because I really wanted to either be in the trenches or to do something where the line between what I was doing and social justice was very clear. And it wasn't as a PhD student. Um, so I think what I would do is that every year I would tell myself, all right, I'm gonna do my masters, I'm gonna do my <laughs> pre-dissertation and then we'll revisit the question again. <laughs> so I, I, I did my masters and I thought, all right, this was good. Not the best, not the most exciting, but, but let's keep going. <laughs> and it took till I would say my third at especially the beginning of my fourth year in graduate school or end of my third year where it just clicked. And what clicked is that I sort of realized that I love the process of designing research questions, figuring out how do you answer it, getting the results that were often messy, figuring out yes. why it was messy. Yes. It was like detective work. You had an yeah. idea, you had a hypothesis, you didn't have the evidence, you had to figure out how to do it, get the evidence. If the evidence didn't fit, you have to figure out why it didn't fit. Uh, what does it mean? Was this wrong? Or could I have done it this way? Or is the hypothesis wrong? And sometimes that's true. I realized I liked that detective work, but it took me three years in grad school to get there, to realize I liked it. Mm. I also sort of made my peace with the fact that I needed to um, develop my sci scientific chops and develop a reputation and do it well. And then I promised myself, I would do the social justice part, that I would That's do the kind of research that I wanted to do out in the field, but that I would first have to, have to figure out how to do the lab part yes. according to the rules of the game before I said, all right, I don't want to play by these rules. Yes. 
So, yeah. so yeah. I think it, it really took, so for all the grad students who are listening to this and who think, is this the right thing for me? I would say, give yourself some time to explore um, to see whether there are parts of the of the work that you like, and if there are parts that you can you that that you can defer. So I, I would say I feel like my career has been in chapters. There's the exploration chapter. There is the doubt chapter. There is the okay, I like this chapter. Then there's the figuring out. All right, here are the other parts that I'm not doing now but I will pursue them in a later chapter of my career. That's so it was when I was an assistant professor that I finally started to do this in the lab, in the field, in the lab, in the field sort of research. That, that is so interesting. And I love this idea that, that, that your life is in chapters because you know, we can look back and, and then we can identify the chapters, we can proliferate on them. We can, we can, you, know, you can go back and you know, highlight parts or not highlight parts, but when you're in it, like the yeah. doubt stage, it's very hard to, to know there's another chapter coming. So That's what right. I love about your, your story is that, you know, those moments of doubt, it's just a chapter. Yeah. And, and, and that you can make another chapter. And so I, I think right. that that's a really um, powerful message. But, but one of the things that, that I know uh, about you and when I just chatted with different, different people, you are incredibly collaborative. Um, you are deadly serious but you also try to create a, a, a family uh, around you. Um, tell me about that aspect of your um, career. Who helped you in, in graduate school? Who helped you in your early years? Um, what, what did your intellectual family look like? Right. I think the key people in grad school were the st graduate students um, who were around me in that cohort. So it was people like Irene Blair, uh, Dave Desteno, John Jost, Curtis Hardin, Alex Rothman, um, Jack Not a bad Glazer. To be around. Yeah, Jack <laughs> Glazer was my my favorite, um, and a bunch of other people, some of whom left the field, but most of whom are in the field, and so that group of friends, Jack and John and Dave and Irene and all of those people are still like friends of mine. Oh, and I think those early years, especially the years of doubt, I think having that group around me um, was really key. Um, and there were other people in the clinical program, Alyssa Apple, who is a really dear friend of mine um, and who sort of has pulled me into other things now. There were, there were a group of people who were really key. And I think those, friends and colleagues are still friends and colleagues today. And I think mm -hmm. that was a big, um, that, was a, that was a really important safety net. Um, Dave and I collaborated uh, a lot and had, had NSF grants together, but interestingly, we didn't collaborate when we were in grad school. We collaborated when we were both assistant professors mm -hmm. and we used to call each other up in the old landline, no cell phones <laughs> yet. And we would commiserate. And then from that came these ideas about his work on emotions and my work on, on prejudice. And we started talking about can emotions amplify, negative emotions amplify implicit prejudice. So that work came as, as uh, in, 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 uh, in grad school or in, as, a, as assistant professors. Mm -hmm. But I think most of it was just having a group of people to bounce ideas off uh, in lab, over coffee, at a, at a bar, over a beer. Um, and that was really important. Interesting, interesting. There, there are just so many d directions that 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 I that I want to go, and and I I want to make sure that that I want to get your thoughts about the field, and particularly during during this this incredible um, political racial uh, moment in time. But but I do want to just talk a little bit about um, the the science, and uh, I have my own favorite paper of yours. But if you were to talk about what is your favorite paper, what I'd love to know a little bit more about is, is the, the nuts and bolts of how do you actually um, um, sort of 
put the idea together. So I'd, I'd love to, I'd love you to share, like, what is, what is your favorite paper that you produced? Not what sort of the, the field thinks of you, but, but what's your sort of That's really your idea that you loved and tell us uh, how that came together. That's a great question. I don't think I've ever thought of it quite that way. Um, I would pick two. Um, and the commonality between both of these papers, actually, the, the first one, early in my career, 2004, um, JESP, uh, Journal of Experimental Social Psychology, with a graduate student of mine, Shaki Asghari, so it's Daskopte and Asghari. Um, and the paper was looking at, was sort of riffing off the earlier work I had done as a postdoc with Tony Greenwald, um, showing how uh, uh, the, the original paper was looking at how seeing counter stereotypes, seeing is believing. When you see people who are different from the stereotype, that registers in your mind and changes implicit associations, even if you are not attending to it or processing it, or even if you don't sort of believe it to be to be true. So that so the idea, so this tagline of the paper was seeing is believing. But the focus here was on gender and the impact of seeing um, women who were counter stereotypic, who were in professions where there are very few women. And we were looking at the impact of that on women, college women's uh, implicit beliefs about their own leadership and about gender and leadership. What I like about that paper is that it, ha it started with the lab study, which tested this paradigm in a very social cognition -y way. At, at a laptop, we showed people little bios and stories of, of women in leadership roles. And then we measured their, their implicit stereotypes about gender and leadership. But then that would have been the same old, same old, but that we didn't want to just do that. We wanted to then see what would happen if we took that study into a real world environment where women see more other women in counter stereotypic roles. So what we did is we happened, thanks to Shaki, have access to two liberal arts colleges in the same town. Oh, that's how that one came. of which was a women's college. Yes. And the other was a co-ed college. Yes. And we recruited these students who had just come into college. So they were first years in college, all women. And we, and we gave them uh, uh, an implicit association stereotype, uh, a gender stereotype IAT. And we found that they both had, uh, both groups had, had sort of moderate implicit stereotypes associating men more with leadership, women more in these background supportive roles than the other way around. We then followed these women to the beginning of their sophomore year. Yes. And we found that now the, the, the groups had totally diverged. Yes. Now the women at the women's college who had seen more women in leadership roles showed no implicit stereotypes about gender. They associated women equally with leadership and supportive roles, whereas their peers at the, at the co-ed college showed significantly stronger implicit stereotypes. And we found that this effect over this longitudinal effect was really driven by how often these women students saw women professors. Yes. yes. So the more women professors they saw, the less stereotypes, gender stereotypes they found, they showed. Mm -hmm. And this was sort of my first attempt as a as an assistant professor um, to try out this, this paradigm, this hypothesis, try it out the old-fashioned way in the lab. And then say, if I then catapulted this into a real context, would the same results hold? Yes. And it sounds as if it should hold, but reality is we know that more than 50% of our studies fail. And so it was such, such an amazing experience yes. when we saw exactly the same parallel. Effect. Yes, yes. And it also very much speaks to your sort of intellectual credo, right, which is person in context. Person but now you context, actually right. really get to see, I, I know that paper quite well, one, because I'm citing it for a paper I'm working on now, but also because it was quite influential related to the National Science Foundation. Yeah. And it really started to change the narrative around not just the role of, of women's colleges and not just the role of women's professors, but the, the, the sort of interaction, like what does it take? And, right. and all of a sudden you're able to show, hey, you know, it, you you can actually um, 
make make change and also right. that implicit bias is predictive and you know there are many that that's a good one that, that yeah. that's a good one that, that that's a good one yeah and that 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 study had an accidental finding which leads me to the to the second paper the accidental finding was we found that uh, in the coed college that students who were taking a lot of math and science classes showed stronger gender stereotypes and then we looked at who was teaching those colleges and those classes, and they were much more likely to be men. That's Whereas at the women's college, it was 50-50. Women and men equally taught those STEM classes. That finding, which is not something I had in my mind, ended up sort of resulting in this, the last 20 years of my research, uh, looking at the effect of those gender stereotypes on women and students of color in STEM. Uh, so I thought that if you put more women scientists and engineers in front of students, would it change not only their gender stereotypes about their group, but would it also change their stereotypes about what is possible for them? That's and it. that was the beginning of my, of my research on, on, um, on stereotypes in STEM and women. And so there's a 2011 paper That's with Jane Stout, uh, yes. Stout et al, yes. where we did very similar things. We had a real classroom study, we had some lab studies, and the classroom study showed that when students happened to be in, in calculus classes that were taught by female professors rather than male professors, even though the lecture was the same, the grading was shared, uh, students signed up for the class before they knew who their professor was. The women who were in the sections taught by the female professors yeah. showed much more positive implicit attitudes towards math, less, um, uh, more, I guess, stronger identification with math, um, and all of those effects, uh, where, where there's, whereas if their professor was male, they, their results, their attitudes were more negative, yes. and their identification was weaker. That's so interesting. That that is so interesting. And you know, it's it's funny because, you know, sometimes you have a finding that you love, and whether it gets recognition in the fields or not, that that's nice. But but it sort of drives you into yeah. the next chapter of, of of your career. So I think that that's interesting. And, you know, that kind of leads to, sort of my, my next sort of set of questions, which is. Um, what what are your thoughts about the field? And I'll start off by, by saying a few things. Um, one is there's a very interesting paper that just came out uh, a couple weeks ago by Joseph uh, Cesario. I hope I'm saying his name correctly. And the paper is uh, sort of in your um, area and it's from in brain and behavioral sciences. And the paper is basically making the argument that the, the work that, that we do on um, implicit bias, but also just the work that we do in social psychology, a, a lot of it related to, to group disparities, really cannot tell us all that much about decision-making in, in the real world. And it's an intriguing paper because he talks about all of the contextual things that are missing. Um, and it sort of ends on a, on a little bit of, a, of, a, of a, a skeptical note about the role of social social scientists and social psychologists in particular, um, particularly those of us that are doing research on not just implicit bias, but intergroup relations more, more mm -hmm. generally, and really asking the question, um, yes, we can keep doing our science, but, but is what we're doing actually helping um, decision makers? Is it actually helping lawyers? Is it actually helping judges? Is it actually helping um, people in the courtroom? Is it actually helping policymakers? Um, and so it's 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 an interesting paper. And you started off your journey with the with the hope and the promise that your detective story would lead to evidence that would lead to change. Mm -hmm. Tell me what your thoughts are about the field of social psychology now, vis-a-vis -vis the relationship between the work that we do and the ability to actually help. You know, are we going to help? President Biden today? Are we going to help a judge who needs to make um, better decisions? What, what are your thoughts right. about that? Right. That's a great question, Valerie. Um, I, th I think that, so uh, several thoughts run through my mind. I think first that it's we, if the questions that drive us are questions that ultimately are about um, something out there in the world, 
then at some point of time or another, we had better test that thing out there <laughs> in the world rather than assume that what we are doing in the lab will generalize seamlessly to the field. But not every one of us, not all uh, social psychologists are interested in questions that are really about something in the field. So I want to leave room for both. So I think there are some questions such questions that are really about the mind decontextualized and those don't need to be generalized to the field. There are other questions like our, my research, your research, many of our friends and colleagues that are ultimately about some phenomenon that is out there in the world and we create an analog in the laboratory and we test them um, and we try and get the causal mechanisms right. Uh, but I think then it's really important that we or our friends and colleagues or our students then test them out in the field. I think that there is always a balance between getting, ensuring internal validity, ensuring causal mechanisms, and then external validity. But I'll also say that testing, testing ideas out in the field is not just about external validity. One of the things I've discovered is that sometimes you, your tests in the field end up changing your theory or yes, modifying your absolutely, theory, absolutely. right? So I think I see it as Bob Cialdini called it full cycle yes. uh, social psychology. And that's sort of what I really, really believe. Well, um, just to press you a little bit, what if we're wrong? What what if we're wrong? You know, what if actually the, the the full circle isn't isn't the full circle because we we then go into the field and we test it and our our effects still hold up, but then the next stage is we give it away and it doesn't actually hold or other things happen. That's a really that's a really important question because when we give it away after we've tested it in the field and we give it away, we are assuming that the context in which it's now tested, right, in some other context, maybe not the one that we tested in, is the same. Yes. But it is often not the same. And this actually goes to the issue that sometimes lack of replicability is theoretically important because it says that there is likely some other moderating variable, right? And oftentimes that moderating variable is a different group of people, a different sample. Who we assumed were the same as the sample we originally drew, but maybe different, either generationally, regionally, in terms of race, ethnicity, and social class, all kinds of stuff. Yes. Um, and the social context in which our ideas were originally tested and then applied later on in a policy setting may not be the same. So I think that 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 I guess there are two things I think. One is if we can replicate our results across settings, which are sometimes happen uh, these days in big collaborations. Uh, but those big collaborations are typically also lab studies or online studies. Yeah. But I actually think we need big collaborations of field studies. That's what yes. we need, I, yeah. especially for questions where we are trying to say something Thing about a field setting, like a, a real social context. So we need those big collaborations of field studies, which I don't think we have enough. Those I'm exist great. in other fields, especially in biomedicine, um, yeah. but it doesn't exist as much in social psychology. Uh, and online analogs are just not the same thing. No, no, they're not. They're, so that's they're, that's yeah. one thing. And I think I was, uh, the second thing I was going to say is that um, when we give our science away and and people test an intervention or something out there in, in the world, I would say we're still, whoever is testing it needs to evaluate it. Because from that evaluation, we'll know if it worked or not. Even if it isn't like a really tight experiment, there should be an evaluation, uh, not an assumption that it'll yes. work because it yes. may, not, may or may not. Yeah. And you know what's interesting as I think about this, and I also think about your role as sort of the institute director, I, I often think that the, the question of what is the role of social psychology vis-a-vis -vis the, the real world, really the, the real question is what are the tools that future scientists need? So my next question to you is, you know, if you were to build a perfect department, 
you already talked about some of the formulaic pieces. You need the strong methods. You need the strong theory. You need some of the classics, um, even though some of the things that many of the former individuals did may not be some of the, the what would be considered appropriate today, but we still need to dig into the classics. What else do you think that young scholars need in order to be equipped to do this kind of bigger science? I think we need interdisciplinarity. Um, this is this is something another sort of thread I've been thinking about a lot in the role uh, as the director of the Institute of Diversity Sciences, um, and also having sat on the National Science Foundation's uh, advisory board for social behavioral economic sciences. What I see from the my NSF role. Uh, and what I see in as an institute director is that, um, well, I'll take the first one first. The, on, the, on the science funding side, there are these big complex questions that are partly social psychological, partly sociological, partly computational, partly engineering, um, and it requires multiple kinds of expertise coming together to solve those problems, to solve those problems in the real world. And let me tell you that a lot of the funding, especially from the NSF, is the big funding is going toward the, the big ideas, which are all multidisciplinary. Yes. So what we need in our departments and to, and to train our students is how to think in those multidisciplinary ways, how to work with people who are from other fields so, and so that we are not too narrow. Yes. Uh, I worry about us being too narrow. So on the Institute side, the goal of our Institute is to bring together people from all kinds of fields, from social behavioral sciences, economic, uh, engineering, computer science, public health, nursing, business, um, and, and natural sciences around questions that have to do with equity. So there's this, the NSF has this language called use inspired science. I call it equity inspired science. Wow, so the goal of the Institute that. is to foster equity inspired science and engineering um, by essentially matchmaking, putting people together, creating funding incentives, uh, getting graduate students to present, ensuring that those students are on the team science. Um, so I see our field as needing to go broader and our training as needing to go broader so that we can reach both into the macro side, um, into things that are in big data, computational, engineering related, as well as the micro side, things that are more biological, more molecular. Uh, I think we spread in both directions. That's so interesting. I, I suspect after this, and I apologize ahead of time, that you will have many, many, your lab will get a lot bigger. <laughs> Uh, sign me up. Um, and you know, it's it's funny because it, the, the what's interesting about this Zoom, you know, context is you know we're, we're having this back and forth, and I get to to ask you questions, and I'm I'm always so drawn um, by your ideas, your precision of thought, but I'm also physically looking at you, and I'm thinking about what what you're saying about what's needed, and I'm also mapping that onto what I know about how scholars of color thrive. And when you look at, for instance, the research on networks, um, we thrive when we have sort of you know wider vine-like networks as opposed to just staying too yeah. uh, narrow in a field. You know, I, th I think about the idea of sort of you know building collaborators, having lots of checks and balances. Um, and so, you know, the, the science that you're doing also represents the formula when you have a person that is, you know, arguably underrepresented, which mm -hmm. we both are um, in the field. So, so it's, it's, it's interesting. And that kind of leads me to, to have to ask you, is there any role that your personal identity, whether it's your, your gender, your sexual identity, your age, your ethnic identity, your, your, your immigrant uh, status vis-a-vis uh, -vis the US or vis-a-vis -vis India, mm -hmm. what role does that play in your intellectual development? And I know that's a backstage and front stage question because you've probably thought about it a lot. Yeah. But then also there might be things you, you haven't thought about, but I'm just curious yeah. about that. I think it plays a huge role. Uh, some that are probably 
um, may be obvious and some that are that are that are not. So I'll say the obvious ones first. I feel this tremendous responsibility um, to ensure that I recruit, I grow, I nurture the next generation of, of students of color and first generation students um, and other sort of marginalized uh, uh, students. Um, and I, you know, this is recruiting season and I'm paying a special attention as I look at graduate student applications and so on um, at those, those groups, because I, f I think that if we really want to broaden the pipeline, then it's incumbent on all of us not to, not to always go to the same sort of same um, types of, of uh, uh, mentees who already have privilege, but instead choose others who may not, other, who, who sort of need somebody like them or who need something slightly different um, or who um, may leave the field otherwise if they don't, if, if, if whatever, everything doesn't, doesn't work out perfectly. So that to me, the mentoring component for the next generation is a huge motivator. And I would say about 50% of my uh, PhD students from when I began to now are students of color, uh, have been students of color. Um, and, and I would like to continue to do that. And more sort of in the last, I would say 20 years, um, I also feel that for a pre-tenure faculty um, to ensure that people um, have some, I'm involved in all kinds of mutual mentoring uh, initiative, some formal, but sometimes things happen at SPSP where I, some, I connect with somebody and we keep in touch, somebody who's having a rough time. It's definitely happened before. So that's on the, on the, uh, the, the way identity affects um, what I do now. I'll also say that, that I think as an immigrant, as somebody who was a member of majorities in terms of I, I was born uh, into a Hindu family, which is the majority group. I was, the, uh, uh, I was born into an upper caste family. I was born into a family that was, that was a middle to upper middle class. So on those dimensions, I was always high status and the majority group. And coming to the US, mm -hmm. I think I suddenly went into very abruptly without any preparation into both a racial ethnic minority and a social class minority, because I was the scholarship student who was, you know, working for dining services and washing dishes, um, <laughs> working in the too. library. <laughs> we um, can wash dishes together. Yeah. Oh, yes. yeah, and and that experience of suddenly being making sure that I had that fifteen hour a week job to pay for books and all of that um, was suddenly made me realize what it means to be not that was not even poor, but that was sort of not even working class, but yes. essentially not have money to do the fun stuff. Yes. Um, and I also suddenly realized what it felt like to be a person of color. And so that's actually why I got interested in race so um, and all this interest in racial prejudice came from realizing how angry I was the first two years in as an undergraduate because I didn't know how to make sense of being a minority person. Yes, you know, I and I couldn't put it in a place. And it, I think it's so interesting because it's it's it, your story is such a fascinating one because you know you talk about the you know anger and and frustration, but but yet you also talk about the absolute. Um, uh, I guess not rigidity, but the precision of the formula, which is play by the rules first, yeah. be the best in terms of the methods of the field, and then and then sort of break break outside of that. Yeah. Do you think that young students today still still see that as the um, formula, and and not because not every formula works for them? And I know this is something you and I talk about yeah. um, a lot. That's a great of color. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a really good question. Um, and right, I did play by the rules 
and play internally in the system before I decided to create my own rules. Um, I don't think that's, that's necessarily the right thing for everyone. Um, I think people have different paths in life and in, and in science. And I think for some students, they may decide that the policy route is the right route for them. Um, or they may decide that they don't want to do sort of straight and narrow social psychology, that they would rather do something else. And if that wasn't valued, then so be it. Um, I think those are decisions we sort of each individually have to make. Um, I would tell students just explore, explore all, all possibilities because you things that seem terrible sometimes are end up, you change your mind about it. And that was my, my sort of discovery about myself that yes. the part of social cognition that I really disliked, it's sort of antisepticness, um, it's decontextualization. I later learned that there was, there was value in that. It's not where I wanted to stop, but I was willing to start there. Yes. Yes. And there was some sort of intellectual exercise of playing with ideas and turning things around in your head that I really loved. That's so interesting. Um, so explore, you know, yeah. I, I would tell students to explore and not to jump to a decision very quickly. That's so interesting because you we talk about playing the game, but it's also just, it's still the intrinsic value. So, yeah. well, our time is coming to a close and I just have my last question, which actually has a series of sub questions to them. <laughs> so one of the things that people don't know about me is I'm actually obsessed with the actor studio and I love watching the actor studio and James Lipton because I love the way how he completely mirrors Goffman's uh, front stage backstage and he gets people talking. And then next thing you know, they're sharing things that they never thought that they would share. Um, and I think that's an incredible way to, to think about how you put together uh, a paper. So I, I, I watch him a lot. And uh, for those of you that don't know, and maybe you don't know this, at the end of the actor studio, he has a series of 10 questions that he asks the people that he likes to interview. So I have, they're very short, um, but I have this series of 10, but I'm only gonna ask nine because one of them is what's your favorite curse word? And I don't want put, to put you on the spot to, 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 to have to say that. So um, so if you will indulge me, the 10 sure. questions that Lipton asks are, and I'll ask the first one and then you respond and then we'll go we'll on and then, we'll, and then we will close. So um, the first question is, what is your favorite word? What's my favorite word? I love words, but I, I um, you only get one. Endeavor. What is your least favorite word? But. <laughs> what turns you on? Uh, things of the imagination. What turns you off? Negativity. Mm. What sound? That was easy. <laughs> <laughs> what sound or noise do you love? Sound of water. Ah, what sound or noise do you hate? Sirens. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? This is a good one. Um, a travel writer. Ah. <laughs> and what profession would you not ever like to do? Something solo. I can't think of a good example, but something where you work alone all the time. Interesting. And the last question, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? It could be God or Kurt Lewin, whatever you desire. A life well lived. A life well lived. I am going to end on that note. I cannot think of a better way to spend my time than with you. You are an inspiration. You are a joy to be with. And I am going to, is now a Friday evening for us. 
I am going to get back to work because I, you, you reinstill my love of science. So thank you so much for your time. And, um, you know, we will just continue our journey together and thank you for what you've done, done for the field of social psychology and for the sciences. I want to thank you, Valerie. I couldn't think of a better collaborator, uh, a better person to like talk ideas with. You're so sort of smart and interesting. And every time we talk, I think I want to spend more time with her. I think the same thing <laughs> as well, as I think that as well. So I am going to close and uh, we will be in touch. So thank you. All right. Thank you to you too.